Okay, so let's go back now uh, to the private language uh, issues. Um, if we uh, turn to page 16, you can see uh, the point that I was making uh, in the last video, at the, at the end of the last video, in terms of why um, Appian went from talking about Descartes and the idea that sensations, thinking, believing, and so forth are essentially private, how he went from that to Wittgenstein's private language argument involving the idea of uh, naming the private uh, think, thoughts, sensations, and so forth. So on page 16, uh, towards the uh, bottom half of the uh, uh, page and the latter half of the last full paragraph on page 16, Appiah says, um, to tr as in summary of, of the argument, if we have mental states that are private, the argument shows, so the private language argument, is supposed to show that we can't talk about them, even to ourselves. Since it doesn't make sense to talk about such private states, Wittgenstein drew the conclusion that there could not be uh, any states in themselves. Right? So after all, if the sentence, uh, there are private states, makes no sense, it certainly can't be true. Way of happy of summing up there, and again that gets at my uh, point in the last at the end of the last video about again the, the idea is all right. Uh, Descartes' view holds that thoughts are essentially private, sensations and so forth are essentially private. No one else can know about them. I know them best. I'm really the uh, only one who knows them. Um, and the idea is well, if that's true, then it ought to be uh, true that we can uh, name those private sensations and in some sense talk about them to ourselves or use that name uh, in some sort of way uh, and therefore if we can't do the latter, if we can't name uh, private sensations uh, successfully then um, the idea is it doesn't make sense that we actually have private sensations. Okay, so let's, I want to try to reconstruct uh, Appiah's uh, uh, interpretation of Wittgenstein here. I'll admit that I think Appiah um, offers up a really problematic interpretation of Wittgenstein here. I've, um, uh, one of the philosophers I've worked on most outside of teaching has been Wittgenstein uh, and, and this issue actually of private language. And so I think he gets it unfortunately wrong uh, in, his, in how he reconstructs Wittgenstein's argument, but we're gonna leave that aside for the moment. We could possibly talk about that in class. So um, here's one way, and I'll, um, I'm gonna put on D2L um, the argument, I'll type up the argument, put it on there so you can actually see it. And so I'll, I'll say it out now, but you can see it there. All right, so the, the first um, premise of the argument that's supposed to lead to the conclusion that there are no private sensations, uh, and therefore Descartes' philosophy of mind is flawed, right? The first premise towards that conclusion is, I take it, that uh, if sensations are private, if thinking and so forth are private, uh, then I can correctly name, identify them, and name uh, name them whenever they occur. Okay, so if sensations are private, then I ought to be able to, I can, uh, correctly name them whenever they occur. And we can this first premise I think we see in a variety of places, or we can get out of a variety of places in the text. So again, page six, uh, uh, that number three, right? Again, where Descartes or uh, Appy talks about Descartes saying that um, your mind and your thoughts are the things you know best. I think can be found um, from that. It can be found on page 11, um, passages we, in the passage we saw before, um, where um, Appiah says um, there's, a, there's a strong contrast between behaviorism and Descartes' view, namely Descartes, thought, namely Descartes thought belief was a private matter, and that this had two consequences, namely that uh, you know for sure what you believe, right, and that only you know what you believe, and then um, and also on page 13, um, we see where um, the, the last line of the first, uh, second new paragraph on page 13, where Appy writes, um, talk about this idea of a twinge, uh, my twinge is, is essentially private. I know about it and nobody else can. Okay. Anyway, so that's the first premise. I think we can get derive it from those passages. So if sensations are private, then I can correctly name them whenever they occur. The second premise is uh, if I can correctly name them whenever they occur, the sensations, whenever they occur, then it must be possible for me to incorrectly name them or identify them, right? And then we can find this idea on page 15, where Appiah says, 
um, explicitly, right, um, the second uh, paragraph under the reconstruction of Wittgenstein's dialogue, where on page 15 it says, but if it is possible for you to remember correctly, then it must be possible that you can remember incorrectly, right? So again, the second premise then is, if I can correctly name them whenever they occur, the sensations whenever they occur, uh, then it must be possible for me to incorrectly identify uh, or name them. Okay, the third premise is, if it is possible for me to incorrectly name them, name the sensations, then I must have a criterion of correctness uh, by which to judge whether I have correctly named them, right? And so um, this we can find on page 15 in the formulation of uh, Appiah's formulation of Wittgenstein's uh, dialogue, uh, particularly the last part, right, where um, Wittgenstein, where he, Appiah re phrase of Wittgenstein is saying, in order to be able to make sense of saying that you have remembered it correctly, you must have a way of telling whether you have remembered it correctly, a criterion of correctness. Okay. Now here, those are the three main premises, and then um, there's two more that kind of go along with that that are uh, central, central line of the conclusion. Namely, but since the sensations uh, are private, since the sensation in question is private, the criterion of correctness must uh, be private too. That's the assumption that any, anything you appeal to is going to be as a criterion, as a way, as a standard for telling whether or not you've correctly named the sensation again. Anything you appeal to is going to have to be in your mind and therefore also private. And as such, uh, there is no objective justification available for whether I've correctly uh, identified or named the sensation again. And so therefore, um, it ends up uh, going backwards to the chain of reasoning, and this will be, I'll talk about this in class some more to make this more sense. Um, uh, that implies those latter two points, namely that the criterion of correctness available would have to be private as well, uh, and therefore um, there's no um, ob objective justification for saying whether or not uh, I've correctly or incorrectly identified a sensation. Um, therefore, uh, there's no sensations that are private. Right? So that's the uh, that's the reasoning, right? Um, and as I've as I've constructed this, uh, it does not depend upon um, the notion of an inf of, of a problematic infinite regress in the way that Appiah uh, talks about. I mean, you could bring that in, and we can talk about that. But it's possible, I think, to reconstruct uh, the argument that Appiah attributes to Wittgenstein without having to appeal to the idea of a, a infinite regress. And I want to um, point to, you know, now that I've, I've laid out, and again, I'll put this on, on D2L so you can see it written out, uh, lay out the argument. Um, I want you to think about whether this way of laying out Appiah's argument actually does um, mean that Wittgenstein begs the question in the way that Appiah talks about at the top of page 18. So I would encourage you to think about this so it's a real sort of real important issue here. Um, does Wittgenstein beg the question in the way that Appiah talks about? And be careful, right? So beg the question here does not mean um, beg the question in the way that has become uh, under way that way that phrase has been come has come to be understood. Excuse me, uh, in popular uh, culture, right? So beg the question doesn't mean um, if something begs the question that does not mean that it uh, prompts you to ask more questions. It means, as Appiah explains that you have presupposed that which you're trying to prove, um, and that's problematic. Okay, so I know this stuff's difficult. Uh, work with it, and we'll uh, talk about it in class a lot more. So have a great uh, snow day. <laughs>